Hi, it's Daryl Judy with Washington Farm Properties and another episode of Casa de Amigos, House of Friends. And it's really turned into kind of like a power player of who's in DC, who are my favorite people, who are the most interesting people that I know, and what are some of my best resources? And so I've come today to interview a dear friend for many years, Edith Gregson Smith. She's the owner and the talent behind Edith Gregson Interiors. And I wanted to share and hear a little bit about your business, what inspires you, your des design aesthetic, and what are people, what they should be looking out for when they're designing a house or they're hiring someone. So we're gonna talk to Edith Gregson. We're gonna walk around her home a little bit, show a couple of things that she's done in terms of design, and um, I hope you enjoy it. Wonderful. Right. So Edith, you've been doing into your design now. You're very talented. Clearly it's a natural talent, but how did you get into interior design? Like what inspired it? What's your inspiration? What, what brought you here today? Well, I grew up in a very, very small town in Vermont and I grew up in this beautiful 200 year old farmhouse and it was a bit funky. Floors were uneven, windows were askew, but it was incredibly charming. It was beautiful, but I always felt this need to show people how beautiful it could be to, you know, because there can be a bit of a difference between uh, things that are sort of funky and fun and, and you know, versus beautiful and, um, and you know, and, and sort of pulling that farmhouse through to be something that felt a little bit stronger, a little bit more beautiful than just, uh, just sort of funky. So it started when I was probably eight or nine years old that I would take it upon myself to start painting rooms, even refinishing the floors. I had this huge opinion about tearing off the front porch. And my parents were incredible because they just chose to nurture this passion that kind of came out of nowhere. And so they would help me go to the hardware store, pick out gallons of paint, um, and, and let me go for it. And I remember painting different rooms, having no idea what I was doing, hoping it would turn out right. It often didn't, but that's okay. Try again, new, new, new technique, new color. Um, and, uh, and I just really learned from, from that experience and the freedom to figure it out on my own. Uh, little by little, it went from sort of these almost craft projects of throwing paint on a wall to honing in um, more thoughtful plans, you know. Okay, well, what does this room actually need? What, what are the um, constraints of the room? Can we refinish these floors? Maybe not, they're, they're very old. Are we gonna be running into hitting nail heads? Um, because again, it's a 200 year old farmhouse. Should we actually try to straighten out the flooring or embrace it and just say it is what it is? And how do we really showcase um, the elements of the home that are, that are truly special and unique? And when is it time to say, okay, we need to get a professional in and, um, and bring things up to speed? Uh, you know, for instance, I, I think a lot of times having a more modern kitchen can make a lot of sense even in the context of a beautiful old farmhouse. Uh, so, so kind of thinking through all these various components. But I would say as much as I, you know, at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, all the way through high school, had these opinions and ideas, it really, it really was very helpful to go and get formal training in the field and, um, and learn how to address interior design from um, not just a creative standpoint, but from, you know, from an architectural standpoint, you know, from a black and white plan, you know, how to really start uh, realizing a full design package, um, you know, from sort of, behind the scenes prior to just showing up and painting a room. So how did you make the transition from eight-year-old design diva, right, to being trained formally? Like, what what was that process? Well, I went to GW uh, for interior design. I felt strong enough in what I had figured out on my own as eight-year-old Edith uh, that I should really pursue specifically interior design. Um, and I also felt strongly that it wouldn't just be the education from 
um, you know, from university in that field that would help me, you know, help propel me forward, but it would also be going to a city. Hence why I landed in Washington, D.C., um, because I knew, you know, coming from such a small town, there would be a lot to learn just by living in a city. You know, what museums am I going to see? What, what are people wearing and doing and saying? Whose house am I having dinner in? All these things that I just knew would be very different in an urban environment versus a small town. Uh, so between the formal education of GW and the sort of personal experience or accidental education of, of being in a city and being in DC, I think that really propelled me forward to just sort of taking in everything I could, really um, enjoying all the new things I, I saw every day and, uh, and then, you know, moving forward and having that sort of propel me towards uh, the field that I now work in. So interior design, it's, I think a lot of people watch HGTV and think, oh, I could do this and I could paint. It is so complex, right? And so when people hire you, what are questions, if you had to tell someone, like, what should they ask the interior designer? If they're going to hire be you or anybody else, what questions are important to know so they can make good educated decisions? You know, it's funny. It's, it's a really good point. It does look very easy. Um, and it, it can be really fun, but you really do want to attack it from a pragmatic standpoint to begin with. Um, and I think, honestly, the questions that are most important are probably the least fun questions in the beginning, which is really, what is your budget? What, you know, what are you looking to spend on this project? Um, and, you know, and also, what's your timeline? Because sometimes it might, it might be, okay, my budget is X, Y, Z, um, and my timeline is tomorrow. Well, that might might not work. <laughs> In fact, it probably will not work. It will not work. Um, but uh, it also starts a dialogue from the beginning where you can share, you know, you know, I can share my experience and knowledge and say, hey, you know, I think that budget will work, but the timeline needs to be extended. Here's why. Uh, because you can't fault anyone who's not in this business for not knowing what they don't know. So it's all about sharing the knowledge that we have from the experience of working in the field every day. Um, and sometimes with budget, it could also be sharing with the client, well, would you like to do this in phases? Would you like to tackle just part of your home at once? Uh, and then, you know, next year we move on to another uh, another part of the project. And I think that can make a lot of sense with, with one's budget, but also, I. I do think that people think it's going to be a lot of fun to um, to dive into designing a home, but it truly is a lot of work, even with us on board, even with the best contractors, the best craftsmen, um, because we ask clients a lot of questions. I, it's probably a lot like planning a wedding. It seems like it's going to be really sweet, really great. What could go wrong? And it's not to say that anything goes wrong, but it does require a lot of thought, a lot of consideration down to every single little detail and we want to make sure people are ready for that and that might mean saying we're doing your kitchen now enjoy your kitchen and we'll do your you know primary bedroom tomorrow right the one thing i the advice to my friends and the clients i would say too and i think you probably would agree with this even though we haven't discussed it <laughs> is hire into your designer who's talented mm -hmm. who you like yeah. but who runs a business yes right because i've seen yes. too many catastrophes with people hiring interior designers and it's the lead time the, the the money all of it but you have to make sure someone can make things pretty but also is running a business as well right right i mean you really have to show up for clients um from a business standpoint just as much if not more than just the creative standpoint i mean they need to understand where their money is being spent um how much more you know needs to be spent to carry the project through because otherwise if you don't have a, a firm plan in place great communication uh, they may have spent all the money they had hoped to spend on that project and that shouldn't be when they're finding out that they're actually only halfway through the project uh, so we have to give them the tools to really feel great about how they're spending their money and making sure they're getting their value you know back or, or getting their their money's worth because i might say you should spend this whole, you know, amount on an amazing carpet. Trust me, it's the best carpet I've ever seen. They might not care about a carpet at all. So it's, you know, it's not for me to decide. It's not for anyone to decide except for the client. Right. So if if I'm gonna hire you, um, I might come in and say, oh my goodness, I have this beautiful Chippendale chair that's my grandmother's, or I have this um, Oriental rug that means a lot to me. Or, so you have different clients with different tastes. Yeah. How do you 
I, I don't know if it, it's a science and a talent, I'm sure, but how do you kind of like work to get their taste and make their things elevated even better instead of doing just what you want to do? Well, it's funny. I actually find that clients coming to us with these um, heirlooms or even just with a vision or a concept of saying, I've always wanted a tufted sofa. I find that to be a great starting point for the project. And in fact, I, I find that very inspiring and a lot easier than when either I'm designing for myself, which feels very hard because I know too much, I guess, at this point of all the options. Um, or a client who says, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I want. That can actually be really hard because you do want to have a roadmap um, to proceed with. But making sure it doesn't suddenly become a theme, right? We want it to feel um, okay. effortless and like and very homey. We don't want to suddenly be, oh, you had a Chippendale chair. This is now your Chippendale room. Let's go to the next room. Oh, I see you have, you know, a beautiful mid-century modern you know, uh, sofa. This is now the mid-century room. Of course, we want each space to really blend into the next and and make sense and also feel current. I mean, I, I don't think I'm the right designer to come to if you want things to be period correct or historical. That's just not really what I do. I'd have to do a lot of research to make that right. <laughs> to make that work. But I am the right person to come to um, saying I have these special things that matter to me. How do we make sense of this? Sometimes it's refinishing a chair new upholstery, uh, and, and sometimes it's rethinking where it goes. This is an amazing chair, uh, but, but dimensions have changed some. This is actually appropriate an appropriate scale for your primary bedroom. Um, it's probably not going to work so well for your living room or whatever that ends up being. Right, right, right. So we're sitting in one of the beautiful spaces that you've created, and you've been so kind to, inter to bring us into your home and to share different things. So is it okay if we walk around a little bit and show as you do your design, the things that you look for or the things that are important to you in the design process? Yes, of course. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to show everything. Okay. All right. Well, let's do that. We'll take a little tour and we'll see more of what you have to offer. Thanks. Before we leave this room, I just wanted to, I was just thinking these are so beautiful. And when you're designing, that's why I'm not such a great designer is that there's a lot to fight with. You've got draperies, you've got carpeting, you've got art, you've got antiques. How is it that draperies, what's your your advice for draperies? I think it can really depend on the room, of course, and, and some clients love to go big, go bold, more is more, pattern on pattern. Uh, for myself, especially when you have a beautiful view outside, I think a lot of times just having it be really about you know, the natural column um, shape that the drapery is going to make on its own because the truth is before you add pattern, before you add texture to a drapery panel, it, it actually already has an interesting texture in how it just falls naturally. So for me, uh, I just love a really simple neutral because sometimes that's just the right answer to just have it be simple, let it recede, and then let the rest of the room develop around it. Edith, I've been in your home and it's gorgeous, beautiful. There's too much to show. <laughs> so I wanted to pick this home or this room because it's very unique. So it was designed as a formal living room, but explain what you saw and your husband saw and what your needs were and how you created this room to be special. Yeah, well, I, I think just because, uh, you know, a room is designated to be the piano room or the formal living room or whatever it might be doesn't mean that's how you should actually use it. If you don't play the piano, don't have a piano room. Or if you don't want someone else to play the piano, don't have a piano room. Um, formal living rooms can be great for some people, but we, you know, we really love to entertain and we do sort of have that balance between formal and a lot of informal. We have a family, we have kids, uh, and we're always trying to figure out a way, you know, in our with our busy lifestyles, how do we still keep who we are, you know, what our hobbies are. And one of our biggest hobbies and passions is music. So we might not be running out the door to Lollapalooza right now, although I hope that changes soon. <laughs> but what we can do is make a room that really celebrates music and art. Uh, and so, you know, after a long day, we can come in here, put on records. After finishing a wonderful dinner party with our open dining room behind you, uh, a lot of times we come in here and have you know, might have a glass of bourbon or scotch and just put on a great record. 
and people love it. They just, you know, pile onto the sofas, lay on the shag rug, open, you know, a, a book about, um, these are basically all of our art books and music books and um, little things we've collected from, from concerts and, and tours, uh, and just really relax and unwind. So for us, this is what made sense. We didn't need another formal living room. We needed a place to listen to a great record and, um, and share that with our friends. So I think it's a great example of how you've taken something that's so special that we need to design, pick those things, mm -hmm. whether it be the collection of books, the vinyl that are here. Um, so not everything was here. For example, mm -hmm. you talked about the, the credenza. Yes, yes, this is a piece I really love. Uh, it's a custom credenza that we um, designed and made, you know, specifically for this room. It sort of set the tone, anchored the space nicely. But again, it's also not what I would call a loud piece. It's really beautiful, but it does just sort of recede in the background. And it gave us a great way of um, anchoring this incredible um, Frank Day photograph above it, uh, which we purchased specifically for this house. Um, we love it because it's kind of dark and moody, which is what this space is all about. Um, but it also has an airstream in it. And my husband and I have always talked about how much fun it would be to rent an airstream and go travel around the country because um, I don't know if that would actually be fun, but it seems like a great idea. It seems like fun, right? And so if we, if we never do, at least we, we can talk about it. <laughs> so it's interesting you point out the Frank Day piece, and I want to also talk about the furniture. So Frank Day is someone that I recognize locally, yes, right? Exactly. Um, a very, very well-known artist. So if someone's doing a home and they, do they go to a gallery and buy art? Should you go something like Washington Project for the art? We, like, how do you get art? Like, do you buy an art because it's going to be for that wall? How would you advise people in terms of they're collecting art for a home to inspiration of what they love? What, what should they do? Well, otherwise? you know, I, I know some interior designers, you know, really know the art world um, in great depth. And, and can sort of advise for sort of the true collector level of pieces, right? Really significant um, um, investment pieces. Uh, admittedly, that's not me yet, maybe one day. I'll sink my teeth into the, the, that space a bit more. Um, but I tend to work with clients on uh, working with art consultants who can help advise them that way, and, and also working with local galleries. I mean, I find that um, Addison Ripley and Hemphill and um, Longview Art Gallery, you know, all these places are just are just great at really helping you and your clients figure out, you know, what to get. What are, what are you looking for? What are you inspired by? Okay, you don't you don't know what you're inspired by. That's okay. Come in and see what we have. Or let's start with you know again budget scale. What's that room for? Um, because I think buying art is something that's it's really intimidating for a lot of people but I do think the more you can take that pressure off of, of clients the better so it might be saying okay you know what you need to get a big you know Frank Day piece uh, because it's going to anchor your room but maybe there's a secondary wall next to it um, that now we've taken the pressure off go on a trip tell me what you find show show us what you're excited about right. you know traveling pieces where traveling you pieces right. because that can be really fun then it really again that's there that's again doubling down that's your home you right. you had an experience and now we brought that home and this is really where you live right you said about the custom piece mm -hmm. so if want to hear does, in, no offense since your designers like <laughs> oh my god it's so expensive so does everything have to be custom it, i mean where like t tell me your formula I, I don't think that everything has to be custom. I also don't think it should be right. custom because I said that because there are just so many amazing pieces that already exist and I think it's really fun to add in you know vintage pieces, reupholster them, give them a you know new life, uh, mix that in with custom. I, I tend to tread lightly with custom pieces because there should be a reason that you're asking a client, to spend more um, or wait a little bit longer. Although right now, honestly, custom pieces tend to be available faster in my experience than, than right. some, some the other pieces. But um, no, I don't think everything needs to be custom. Uh, it should be for a specific purpose. Uh, and then I think it's about rounding the room out. So this room in particular, 
There's, you know, I'm looking at a Salvation's metal side table that was purchased off um, the, the floor at the design center um, because, you know, we just needed a side table and we didn't really want to overthink it. Right. Uh, or it might be, um, you know, custom pillows but paired with uh, a crate and barrel pillow. So I think it's just that give and take of, of um, making clients feel like it's a rounded home. I also think it then, you know, you're hitting uh, different markers with, with budget usually. You're able to sort of come up with a reasonable, uh, you know, a reasonable um, number instead right. of just doing all custom. So t tell me color because some interior designers you could have a hundred shades of white. What's your advice on color? How do you how do you how do you help your clients? I think you know, paint and color in general are are really really important. I mean, specifically with paint, it is probably the most impactful thing you can do in a room for the least amount of money. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. It can really transform a space. But you can't skip the steps of making the right choices. And by that I mean you know, really having a conversation, how do you want your house to feel? Light, airy, you know, dark, cozy. Um, and then really looking through, okay, we, I'm holding all of your fabric samples. Your, I have your sofa fabric, I have your carpet, you know, sample, I have all these elements. Now we're ready to pick um, the paint color. Because I also do think it's, it's, it makes sense to start with the most limiting factor in the room. Um, the most limiting factor in the room is not gonna be the paint color because that is limitless. We can pick anything we want. Right. Uh, picking the right carpet could be a little bit harder. Picking the right sofa fabric, a little bit harder. Once we nail those down, we then go to paint. Um, and then once I select a handful of concepts, you know, to share with the clients and they have a, you know, they think that that's the right way to go, we then make sure to paint samples on the wall, ideally in a couple of locations, the lightest part of the room and the darkest part of the room, two coats you know, of the sample on the wall. And then we ask our clients to sit with it and really look at it in the day, at night, on a cloudy day. It changes a lot and we don't want them to walk in, especially if it's a kind of throughout wall color that's, you know, all around. You just, it just needs to be done right and you can't skip it. Right. So paint is easy. I don't like to paint, I can paint over it. But <laughs> I, I noticed the, the wallpaper that's behind us. Oh. So could you talk a little bit about wallpaper and what you've done here and your advice on wallpaper use it don't use it is it a fad is it like how how do you suggest using wallpaper i love wallpaper um and i think it really depends on the client as far as how far you want to take it some clients a lot actually many clients come to me and sort of act like they're admitting a, a secret and they just sort of want to whisper i kind of like wallpaper and i and i let's say let's celebrate that that's great there's many reasonable ways to use wallpaper i think sometimes people still think in terms of their grandmother's wallpaper. Right. Although I will say a lot of that is coming back in, in style right now. Uh, for me, I want to make sure it's something that I can live with in in another five to 10 years. I don't know if you should ask more of your wallpaper than five to 10 years, um, but I like neutrals that um, are still giving back to the room. A little bit of a risk, whether it is the texture or the color, you know, whatever it is. but. You know, wallpaper to me is about taking a risk in some capacity. So for me in the dining room, um, I found this beautiful Innovations wallpaper. So we got up out of the chair, came over to see the wallpapers because it's so interesting and I want to let you share a little bit about. Yeah, I, you know, I really love this wallpaper by Innovations. It has a lot of natural tone to it. It's actually just very, very thin um, pieces of wood veneer. And what that does is it just reflects light and let, allows it to bounce around the space, which is great because before it was just a painted wall and it was it was fine, but this added just that next level of depth and that little something special. Right, it's a very special room, right? So wallpaper, hair wallpaper, some people might panic because if you don't, don't have a big budget, it might be hard to do. So if, if you had to help a friend, a client and said, listen, I can't afford an interior designer, what would you tell them, like, you said the word layering before. Sure. What are some key concepts that they can bring their own things in that are important, like lighting and layering? What are the, the yeah. key things? I think um, that lighting is incredibly important. Honestly, if someone were to, even with a modest budget, want to really invest in something that will make their ha home feel, 
you know, just really showcase in, in the strongest way possible, it would be to invest in, in good lighting. Um, because LED lighting has come so far, you can really spend a lot less per recessed light fixture. Um, so that, that's huge. That's a, a, a great way to kind of get back to a room. Um, I think also, you, you know, everyone can afford wallpaper. Just be mindful of what you select. So going with even a vinyl material, that's another product that's come a really long way. There are a lot of beautiful vinyl papers that have incredible um, textures and colors, and because it's not necessarily wood veneer, the price point is much more reasonable. I want to talk one more thing about your house as we go to the next thing. It's about children, right? Uh. This is a house of children. <laughs> this is a very busy house. You're, um, Edith, you're one of the greatest cooks I know, like amazing. And so this is a house that's lived in. Yes. And oftentimes people are fearful if I'm gonna do interior design, I, I can't sit down in it. It's all white, it's all this, it's I can't. And so I wanna share a little bit about your home and how you've been able to transform it and make it livable and durable and still beautiful at the same time. I think that sounds wonderful. So on the way to, to our next little site that I wanted to share, I had to stop and have you explain this wallpaper because this is a pow moment. This is a pow moment, which is also why it's contained and, and sort of an accent that you walk by because I do think a room all in this might be um, a little heavy handed, at least for my personal aesthetic. Uh, but this wallpaper is really, really special to us because uh, it's called Frequency and it's designed off of music. If you were to look at it, you know, turn it on its side, this is how um, this song reads. And, it, and the colorway is called Black Dog after the, the Led Zeppelin song, which also is one of my most favorite songs. I used to blast it, you know, out the windows when I was younger. So it feels really fun as a grown up to, <laughs> or grown up, uh, to, to go back and celebrate something uh, that's so personal. So the home is not just about, is it pretty? You want it to be pretty, but to have meetings. So when you go buy this on a busy day, taking the kids off to daycare, you're like, oh my God, that reminds me of my childhood, right? Right, right, and it's us. It's all, you know, it's our personal story. And I think that's so important for people, especially with working with an interior designer. It's all about us learning who you are and then designing from there. Right, as um, I think it was Oprah always said, your home should rise up to meet you when you come home, oh. right? And so when you walk in, this is something that I feel at home. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next thing. Okay. So we're in your family room and so much of the entertaining today, I mean, you have young children, but you want to be part of it. You need to see them and watch them You're in a kitchen. You cook a lot, but how do you, how did you arrange this knowing that you have a one-year-old, yes. right? And you have a, uh, a young little Missy who is active. <laughs> So how, how did you design the room to protect them and to not ruin everything and make it yeah. look good? Well, I just think that um, just because you, uh, you have kids or dogs, cats, whatever you know, it may be, you shouldn't have to um, choose between having a room that looks really beautiful but is also incredibly functional and, um, and durable and all these things. Uh, we do entertain a lot. I want the house to be ready for that but we also entertain our children a lot and it needs to be ready for that. Uh, so in this room, we went with a, um, a really durable, cleanable wool rug from Rejuvenations um, that also has a lot of bold colors, um, which really helps a lot. If this were a white rug, it would have been over on day one and instead we're able to clean this as we need to. We can, um, you know, scotch guard it, uh, protect it. And, and again, it just is, uh, it's really it just hides things a little bit as right needed. perfect um, and then you know also we went back and forth coffee table glass table ottoman we had concerns that an ottoman would really break down quickly with spills we do eat in here a lot you know we do live our lives in here a lot we have our feet up on the table we you know we are a very relaxed family we want to feel comfortable this is our home right um, so uh, so we ended up taking a restoration hardware base and then did a custom upholstered um, top to it, which is both comfortable enough to sit on, put your feet up on. Um, we can wipe it down because it's a faux leather. 
Uh, I have seen my daughter spill pretty much everything under the sun on it, and it still looks like new. So it was a win-win for all of us. Right. This, this room is very comfortable. I love the rug, the color of the rug. The chair is comfortable, but it's also like unexpected too, like have pottery. Right. Like, how do you do your mixed media? Like how, like, how do you, it's not sterile. How do you achieve something that's not sterile? Well, I think, you know, to your point, you know, how to make it seem like you haven't just walked into a showroom is that you should be purchasing and collecting items from multiple places and with multiple textures and finishes. So a lot of times when I'm coming to someone's home, maybe it's just to supplement items they already have, I, I do sort of think to myself, okay, well I see a lot of uh, you know, stone side tables or, or a lot of metal in this room. Why don't we add glass? Why don't we add upholstered pieces? You know, it's sort of rebalancing spaces, adding in a ceramic um, lamp in a room that's otherwise fairly modern. That sort of brings it back a little bit, makes it a little cozier, a little homey. Um, so I do think it's important to mix in all these textures. Right. So you get a ha you get a room that is beautiful. You live in it. You have your Christmases. You have your bus mitzvah. You have you have all the celebrations, right? Yeah. How long does a room last, or do you change it often, or do you tweak it, or what's yeah. your ideas on that? Well, it's funny, people always assume since I'm an interior designer that I must absolutely love changing my home around, doing all these fresh things. And I think in theory I would, but I am very busy <laughs> and it just isn't the reality that I live in. Um, and so this room has been this way for about six years. And what I do to freshen it um, as we need to, other than you know the natural care that you should consider by using companies like Christopher's or Silkwood to actually take care of stains, stain resist, treat your upholstered goods, keep them fresh. Um, I do like to change out toss pillows. That can be a really easy thing to do to make it suddenly feel fresh and new. Uh, same thing with throws. You know, it's a great way to add pops of color, texture, layering. Um, and sometimes I actually swap with different rooms. So in the winter, um, we do celebrate Christmas. We have a big Christmas tree. Uh, I, I like to add in a bunch of pops of red in here because it just sort of doubles down on that seasonal feeling. Right, right, right. So I, I, I love this room, but I just, I want to go up and see the bedroom and I want to see the little girl's room and see what you've done with that that's special. I'd love to share with you. Okay, cool. Okay, well I just have to show you this amazing light fixture, a vintage piece that we added to the room. Again, with kids and everything being so sort of busy, needing things to be durable down here, this was a great way to add a bit of sparkle and something that really elevates the room that we don't have to worry about. It's amazing. This has been a really great use of a tight corner for us, a place where the kids can do homework, we can sit and have a cozy meal by the fire in the winter. Um, we usually, I really love cut flowers, and these ones actually came from our garden, which makes it even more special. So a place to display a fun arrangement um, and finish off a corner in a way that's really functional and unexpected. It looks amazing. It would be fun to share a really cozy corner of our primary bedroom with you as well because I think when space allows it can be amazing to have a little sitting area of sorts. Admittedly half the time this is where my laundry gets folded <laughs> while I'm watching TV or you know checking on the baby um, but also I'll sit here with a cup of coffee start my day go on my laptop a little perch and I just love how cozy it is with the um, you know, frames, uh, little medallions behind me, this little reading corner, uh, and the design within reach articulating sconces. So I really want to show you one of my favorite um, parts of the house, which is my daughter Ford's bedroom. Um, because I think when designing a kid's room, it doesn't have to be just sort of kitty. And, um, you know, it really can also be sophisticated. So we designed the whole room around this amazing uh, Christian Dior uh, scarf that we framed at uh, Framesmith DC. Paula does amazing work. Uh, 
and then from there we just just kind of develop the whole space around it. So pulling, you know, the sofa material from the green leaves and the in the scarf, the wall color, keeping it feminine because my daughter is going through a whole pink thing and we want to embrace it, but also making a room that feels really lovely for us to be in, to be reading bedtime stories right here in this cozy corner. So I want to thank you so much for doing this with us because there's you have a talent, you have a natural beauty in what you do work-wise and as a human being. And I love that you shared your home with us. Um, but as we were walking through, there was something here that caught my eye and I wanted you to talk about this wall. This admittedly is probably my favorite part of our whole home. Uh, it's a collection, a gallery wall of photos of my daughter uh, Ford at the time, my, you know, my firstborn. And it's, it's just a great collection of all these wonderful special memories. Again, that makes this our home and really personal and, and you know, and just reminds us every day of, of um, the happiness we experience here, this happiness as a family with our, you know, and, and inviting friends into this space. Uh, this is actually a gallery wall by Framebridge. So it also is probably one of the least expensive things we've done. And it's incredibly impactful. Right. So anybody can live in a house, but it takes a little bit of work to actually turn it into a home. So thank you, Edith Gregson, um, Interiors, Daryl Judy, Washington Fine Properties, Selling Real Estate, DC, Maryland, Virginia. And um, hit us up. Edith, what's your, your Instagram? Uh, Edith.gregson.interiors. There we go. And Daryl Judy, thank you. Thanks.